Hello, everybody. Oh, my God. I got a brother on here on Strong Inspirations. He a good-looking guy. <laughs> I know he, oh, I know he know what he's talking about. He a good-looking man. And he decided to come on our channel to share some knowledge, to, to enlighten us today. Oh, my God. I'm telling you, this is what we do as Strong Inspirations. I find these people and, and I let them tell a story and there's stories to be told. He's in a town that I've never been in, but I heard a lot about it now, everybody. And I know you heard about it too, because you are some knowledgeable lookers on to the Strong Inspirations channel. And as you know, I want you to do me a favor, everybody, hit that subscribe button hit the like button on this video, hit the notifications bell, because I'm uploading four, five, six videos a week. It's that much content out there. And this ain't just a Black History Month thing, not at all. Black History Month is 365 days a year because we Black every day of the year. And if it's a leap year, we Black on that day too, all right? So hit, hit them buttons. Be a part of this strong inspirations family. If you know, and you've been watching us, you know I got this documentary out on the rise of black business in America, where we talking about slaves now who went to college. You can't hold us back. If we gonna learn how to read and write, we gonna get good at it. And we gonna go to college and graduate. And there were not just HBCUs open for black people, there was white institutions. Dartmouth, that Ivy League school was accepting blacks. Oberlin in Ohio was accepting blacks. And I could name others. It's in my movie, watch it. It's not just that we talk about, we talk about it. It's 75 minutes long. So we talk about a bunch of stuff. And uh, it's, it's streaming on Amazon. And then I had so much fun, I wrote the book. I'm kind of you know, might be a little brother that be, I, well, let me put it what I do. I follow through. That's what I do. I follow through. So I wrote the book and the book took me two years to do it. And uh, it's like the movie, but it's got more facts. And it's, uh, it's, it's going to blow your mind. It's going to blow your mind so much. You're going to be like, man, I don't believe that. So I put the link in the back of the book where I found the fact. It's on Amazon also. Or just go to my website inspirationsbystrong.com and I you might know I say strong a lot and I do because I like that word strength tenacity resilience and a sense of oneness nobility and grace that's strong in my book so uh man I'm I'm tripping uh, today that this brother decided to come on my channel because he is well respected in his town Everybody know him. He know everybody and they like what he's doing. I appreciate you coming on the channel. Tell us who you are and let's get started. Good morning, Anthony. My name's Bobby Dennis. I'm president of the Natchez Association for the Preservation of History and Culture. This is a group that was formed in Natchez by a group of ladies let me give their names. I have to give them props. Because yeah. Women have been leaders and overlooked as leaders in the black community a whole lot. So first of all, there was Judge Mary Lee Tolles, Josie Camper, Flora Terrell, Mary White, Patricia Washington, Juanita Jones, and Patricia Powers. Okay. Now these ladies come up with, had a, a strong idea, a custom of wanting to preserve the history and the culture mm -hmm. and show the world that we delivered something, not only to our community, not only to our state, but to the nation. Okay. So like when that. we start going into the history of Natchez, we have to look at it from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. 
most people look at the beginning of slavery in Natchez with the, say, a little pre-Civil War stuff. Okay, let me stop you right there. Let me start right quick. And uh, don't, don't lose your thought. You say Natchez, Natchez, Mississippi, right? Correct. Now, why do I know Natchez? Why do I know that name? Natchez is the oldest city on the Mississippi River. Okay, because I, I, I know I heard the oldest Natchez. Oldest city, period. Yeah. When you think of Natchez, or when we think of Natchez, we think of the beginning of civilization in the South. Wow. Whereas, whereas the way Natchez developed, Natchez was a French territory to begin yeah. with. We're going to go before the United States had control of this area. And that is an important point for us as black people to realize that I have a saying before I do a tour at our museum, before there was a slave in Natchez, there was a free black man in Natchez. So we have to understand that Natchez developed out of three different countries before it was a part of the United States. Okay, okay. We had the French, we had the Spanish, and then we had the English. All three of these countries had rules and regulations governing slaves, slave trade, and et cetera. Okay. We also know, and this is from the written text that we found in the early colonization of Natchez, that when they established a place here in Natchez to colonize, they call it Fort Rosalie, the first major settlement. Now who did that? The French? The French. Okay, I got you. And when the French established it, their goal was basically to enslave the Indians, have them build a community, and live happily marry on. <laughs> but in all conquering nations, you're going to find they get crazy, greedy. Mm -hmm. We have to think of a conquering nation or uh, the early explorers. They didn't have women with them, so they mingled with the Indians and they mistreated them. So the Indians rose up against them in what we call the first French Indian Wars of Natchez. Now, what happened there lays the groundwork to our existence here in the city, okay. black people existence. Okay. This first war was the first ruler or the first war king a war chief of the Indians was a black man. Wow. A free black man. And he led this first revolution. So the French said, my God, this was the start of the beginning to the end of relationships of blacks, whites, and Indians. For this All right, area. let me stop you. I got a question. So this black man is an Indian. He is a free black man that attached himself with the Natchez tribe of Indians. Okay, so now, and then he grow, he goes to be, he talks his way to be like the head guy or something like that. He was a, he was a war chief. All right. Now, I'll take you back a little bit further, uh, Anthony. Okay. When, we, when, we, when we look at the relationships between blacks and Indians, when we look in our area, we can't consider Mississippi a state yet. Oh, we you. are pre-colonization. Like, okay, I got you. I got you. And to bring that settlement in and how a black man could get to Natchez and a free black man at that, we have to understand the movement of slaves on the eastern seaboard the movement of slaves in the Caribbean, which was a holding post. Right. And then the movement of the Seminole Indian tribe as a whole. And we had revolts where slaves escaped. Most of them made their way to Florida, 
And if you look at the Florida Keys, you'll find some of those islands were occupied by free blacks for a long time until they saw value and turn into resorts and things. Yeah, I got you. I got you. So we followed that movement all the way to Natchez. And then when the French did establish the colony, a second revolution started, which was led by another free black man <laughs> that the French brought with them. And he was an uh, interpreter. Once he hooked up with the Indians and started this next revolution, this revolution entailed all the French territories. And if you know the Louisiana Purchase, you got Louisiana parts of Arkansas. I mean, it was a huge area. Okay. Um, and during this revolution, the French had really just had enough. Once they captured this man, they began disseminating the Natchez tribe of Indians just like that. Now, what's his name? Do you uh, Barnabas. I, I, we, yeah, I, I've I got all heard of this him. information here. But <clears throat> it, was, it, it was the beginning of the end for the Indians, totally. Because those that were captured during this part, this revolution, they were sold into slavery. Not in the United States. They were taken all the way back to Haiti and sold as slaves. The, the Indians were. The Indians. The Indians. Mm. Anyone that participated in that revolution, they eliminated them. This began the trail of tears for Indians where we start seeing the move westward for the Indians. They started migrating all your old Indian tribes west. I got so, you. So look into your history books. We have one of the largest Indian mounds in the United States that still exists. It's called Emerald Mound, a burial ground. Oh, burial the ground. Aztec okay. Indians, yeah, the Aztec Indians and uh, most of your, but the Natchez Indians were very, very uh, resourceful because they were farmers as well. Most of the Africans that did come to the United States had a large farming experience. So all of this played a part in the development of the black man here in Natchez. Natchez, Mississippi, before the Civil War, had the largest concentration of free blacks in the state. There were 208 free blacks registered in the 1860s. And 200 of them was in Natchez. 208 of them were right here in Natchez. All of them were, Natchez, they were pretty, pretty darn successful. We know that the French brought free black people on their explorations. They brought free trade, black tradesmen when they were developing Natchez in the early stage. I got you. So you, you, you know this much, but the first one that was connected with the Indians, and this is strange too, Anthony, no one ever knew his name. In other words, they're not gonna give us a trail or a track to trail this man. I got you. So the earliest and the most simple way to find that trail is to study the Seminole Indians of Florida. A lot of historians talk about runaway slaves on the Eastern seaboard. A lot of those slaves ran south. I've heard of that. Florida. I've heard of that. And they found refuge with the Seminole Indians. Okay, I've heard that, yeah. Okay, now we go into looking into the lifestyles of a Seminole Indian. A Seminole Indian lived in what they call pods. They have a village here, a village there, and they extended from Florida through Georgia, through Alabama, to parts of Mississippi. And I think some 
places as far away as Texas, they've discovered Seminole. All right, I got you. And you, you I, I know, I know you're quite familiar with um, the lawsuit that the Seminole Indians put up against the United States government, whereas they're still trying to sell the black Seminole <laughs> suit. So it, it is it is a yeah. crazy world. Now are these yeah. Indian living living in teepees like again you see in the movies? The teepees look more like huts that you see in Africa. All right, you know if we can if we to continue to move forward, even after the French took control of the area, at some point they relinquished it to the Spanish. Now, the French has set up certain laws that no slave owner could allow their slaves to mingle or intermingle with the Indians after this first revolution. So they had established laws that took a lot of control over the slaves. But then after that, you had the Spanish come in, which gave the slaves a little bit more rights. Okay. Rights such as they could buy their freedom. They could uh, sue, actually sue for being mistreated. These were mostly free blacks that did the suing because you, know, you had a person to come to your house, do some work for you, and then you don't want to pay them. Okay. We found quite a few of those type of suits in our research. Oh, man. So the next thing, yeah. the Spanish were a little bit more lenient with Blacks, and they were more lenient with their relationship with Blacks. And there was a Spanish governor who married his slave. Wow. <laughs> you know, them and, sisters are bad, man. He couldn't help himself. This is this is this is my favorite story yeah. because it, it once he married his slave, they had children. He made sure he wrote up a will that stated none of his children or their children or anyone associated with his family could ever be sold into slavery. Yeah. And after this, he will each one of them a great sum of land and property. So he, she put it be, on him. This began, well, it, this, this began another start for free blacks in Natchez. Free blacks <clears throat> had a society pretty much set up for themselves. And when you look at that Barlin family, you look at how education was set up here in Natchez, your first schools. This family had a relationship that began the ascension of Black pride, Black everything when it comes to developing this area. Now, as we move further along, we go into a stage where we want to look at how free Blacks lived. Right. We want to know what was their status. What, how can you live as a free Black right. in a territory that had slaves? Well, we found a diary by, of a man named William Johnson. Mm -hmm. There's a book out now, The Barber of Natchez. He was a free black. Now this free black owned slave. You say the brother owned slaves? Free oh, blacks were allowed to buy and own slaves. We didn't have what they call, at least from studying and looking at the land plots in the area, all of this is still in downtown Natchez area. Now he owned a plantation that was further out, but his main profession was a 
they call him a businessman and a student businessman, and he was a barber. He made sure each and every one of his slaves learned a workable trade, a trade that would support them at the time they became free. None of his slaves would ever leave his possession without knowing how to support himself and a family. Here in Natchez, we sent the first black senator to the United States Congress. Really? Hiram Rebels. Now there were what, six or seven black sen senators in Congress during the early years. Uh, the reconstruction period. Natchez had a whole, all of his black citizens, his black population before the Civil War were pretty, pretty wealthy. They, they, they were able to maintain wealth. Mm. Now, once the Civil War started, you got to remember that it took only one shot from the U.S. Navy for Natchez to surrender. Really? So Natchez never... <laughs> and Natchez never was a part of the Confederacy in that sense. Natchez was occupied by Union troops during the entire Civil War, pretty much the entire Civil War. Mm. And the troops that were here in Natchez was United States colored troops. Oh, <laughs> the brothers down there doing it. United States colored troops, yes. Uh, Fort McPherson. And that's another interesting story because it led to one of the rumors in which I get calls, I mean, all the time about the Devil's Punch Bowl. The Devil's Punch Bowl. Uh, what's that? The Devil's Punch Bowl is a place, okay, here in Natchez, you had a bunch of runaways that came to Fort McPherson to seek refuge. So there's a rumor that was started that these slaves were brought and thrown, dumped down in large concentration camps in an area in the lower part of, of uh, Natchez. It's, it's hollows. I mean, it's right on the river, but it's hollows. And uh, they said that all these slaves were mistreated, abused, died from <clears throat> these horrible diseases. This is one of the craziest rumors I've ever heard because being, being a Nazi, when I'm growing up, I never heard these stories. No massive deaths, no massive dying from smallpox or any of the crazy diseases that were going on in those okay. days. Okay. And that was disputed. But everything that said about the concentration camps led back to what we call the Forks of the Road. Okay. Which was the second largest slave market in this area, the South, really. Only slave market that was bigger than down here was uh, that one in New Orleans. Okay. And another thing we we have to keep in mind too is that most of the slaves traded <clears throat> here in the Mississippi Valley after Cotton became king were slaves that were brought from the eastern seaboard because the United States had put a ban on slavery, international slavery. Right, trade. right, right. Okay, I've got you there. So after the invention of that cotton gin, farmers could farm more cotton, needed more slaves to work in the fields, and it brought uh, inflow. We've had we've got a map that seventy five percent of the population here in Natchez at one point was slaves. 25% white. Hmm. Okay, I got you. But now, 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 you lost me a little bit on that. Now, what happened at that, at that uh, 
you said was going on at that concentration camp. The Devil's Punch Bowl, nothing actually happened. Everything they said about the Devil's Punch Bowl, can you conceive black soldiers abusing slaves? Black soldiers? Yeah. Now, I've told you that Fort McPherson was occupied by Union forces which consisted of the United States Colored Troop. I got you. Who would man the refugee camps but those United States Colored Troops? Why, why was they enslaving and capturing Black people anyway? They wasn't enslaving them. When, when the Civil War broke out, you had slaves escaping these plantations, coming to Natchez, seeking safety, safe harbor. I got you there. So the same thing was going on on the Eastern Seaboard where a slave would run away, go to a Union camp, and would not be returned back to the slave owner. Period. I got you. I got you. This was happening in Natchez. So Natchez population exploded. Yes. You had over 10,000 people come here one time seeking refuge. I got you. And they did have a camp to keep from the spread, to keep the spread of disease from the camp from getting into the city. We oh. never knew what was going on. Okay. But they were not, so to speak, mistreated or, beat, or, turned, or turned away in such a manner that is spoken of with the devil's punch bowl rumor. And is that that's what it was called, the Devil's Punch Bowl? That's what they call it, yes. Mm. Uh, okay. And it's, it's, what's that? I said interesting, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's very interesting. When you look at when when we look at Natchez history also, we look at now we put out the first black politician. We know that Natchez wasn't a part of the Confederate Union. Right. We know that the United States Colored Troops that were stationed here in Natchez played pivotal roles in the Battle of Vicksburg, the stopping of Jefferson Davis from leaving the area to, to reform the Confederacy. Uh, there were several, several battles fought in the area, but they never was captured by the Confederacy. Confederacy was never bold enough to attack Natchez to try to recapture it. Mm. So it was, it, we played a good role in the battles that took place here in the Mississippi, in this part of Mississippi and up until we do have the connections of that troop with, associated with uh, the Vicksburg battles. I got you. Let, let, let me ask you this. Is Natchez, is the Mississippi River connect to the Atlantic Ocean somewhere? Is it? I, the Gulf of ship? Mexico. Okay. Gulf of Mexico. So so slave ships can go actually right and dock at, at in Natchez? We, they never had a, no. We never have any record of any slave ships coming up to Mississippi. Okay. Uh, I think you, you may, you could get some of those impressions. Mark Twain spent a lot of time in this area. Natchez was a high rolling town. High roller. Mississippi River town all together. Gambling. Yeah, we I have outlaws. Everything. When you're a city older than New Orleans, actually you become a town of commerce because cotton you. was so prevalent. I got you. I mean at one point there were more millionaires in this city than any place of its size anywhere in this country. Ooh. And we're looking at a country that was Ooh. half of what it is now. Okay. Let, so, let me say, uh, as we you know, kind of come to conclude, I, let me ask you about yourself. Are you you a native of Natchez? 
<laughs> and if you look back in your history, what what is your history in, in your forefathers in Natchez? My on my father's side, my father's side come from a lineage of free blacks. John Boyd, the president of Alcorn State University at one point from 1960s to 68, I believe. That was my great uncle. Okay. The lineage on that side of the family, we trace all the way back to Boston. On my mother's side, my mother's side come from a family of slaves. That was traced to a plantation owner by the name of Chamberlain, who had a large plantation on the Natchez Trace Parkway as it exists now. You could see that plantation, parts of it, remnants. <laughs> Okay. As a matter of fact, I was able to meet one of the uh, descendants, and that the slave owner gifted us some very interesting pieces I'm sure. from that plantation. Uh, but 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 you don't have Indian in you. You you there's no connection to Indian in you, right? No. You see all that okay, I got you. Uh, mixed blood of, of white and. <laughs> Well, I take that back. There was some some Indian on on my father's side because uh, okay. the Homer Chitter Indians uh, they were mingled with the boys. I got you. I got you. Yes. As we come across, tell us about the museum. Uh, you gave us the founders. What's the uh, what's the, uh, what's the website? How do people uh, okay. support the museum? Actually, the website is visitnapat.com. Okay. The museum is probably one of, I think it's, it's probably the largest, has the largest collection of the history of the Black families from colonization all the way up into the current time. Okay. We try to amplify people like Richard Wright, Elizabeth Greenfield. Because they're from Natchez. Called, they were from Natchez. Okay. Uh, who's Elizabeth Greenfield, William Steele, the writer of uh, the World's Fair, New York's World's Fair uh, music, the writer of the Bonanza thing. Something, you know. Yeah. So we we do highlight those. We have a lot of important people that came out of the city of Natchez. Okay. Uh, most of the visitors that come here also take back that the amount of the success of free blacks has led to the success in building our relationship today with the city of Natchez. Okay. Because the civil rights era, everything, everything that you read and hear about what was happening in large cities was going on in Natchez at a larger scale though. I got you, I got And you. we have those stories in collect, and, and we've been able to collect those stories. Uh, okay. So to visit a museum like us is to learn a community from its roots. We're not talking about the chains and everything. We're talking about the people that were in chain. I got you. We're talking about the trials and tribulation of people. I got you. I like that. So yeah. no one has sit down and told the story or want to listen to our story. You'll find many interpretations. Yes. And that is one of the mottos of the group. I got you. We exist to tell our stories. 
Yes. I no like one it. can tell our story better than we can tell. I our like story. it. Uh, Brother Dennis, man, I uh, I truly appreciate you coming on Strong Inspirations and sharing that with us. Um, uh, I'm, I'm coming down there. I, 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 I have, I, I'm coming because I like this kind of stuff. I like my yeah. people. Uh, I'm on my way. Let me tell you, you, you're probably running to one of your cousins. Down I here. can't imagine. I can't I'm imagine. You, you will. Thank you for being on the channel. I, I, I say this to you, though, my brother. I want you to stay strong, stay safe, stay on your grind. I truly appreciate you being again on here on Strong Inspirations. Everybody, we're going to have all the website and stuff in the description of this video. We're going to stay in contact with him. Uh, just, hey, you blew my mind, man. I'm happy to hear that the brother stood up and the sister stood up like they did because we need to know that because you know what I did? My word is strong. And what we talked about is the resilience of these people. Thank you for being on this channel. We'll talk soon. All right. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye-bye.